save transient conduction for the final exam. Okay? So you're going to have two questions uh, because I think that gives sufficient time to complete the exam. Okay? So two questions. One on fins. Okay, and uh, this could be any of the different types of cases we've discussed in class including a problem I solved on fins using the idea of contact resistance. Okay? So, plus the different cases. And then uh, radiative uh, heat transfer, the introductory parts of two Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, intro plus Kirchhoff law given a certain distribution can you calculate the emissive power or the emissive flux uh, emissive power emissive flux they are all the same things power and flux are interchangeably used in radiation that is just nomenclature okay transient conduction will be saved for the final exam Because this typically takes a little longer than these radiative uh, heat transfer problems. <coughs> Is that okay with everybody? Okay, it's going to be similar to the pattern of uh, the first exam. You're going to have four hours, two questions. Uh, I have a practice exam set up on Carmen. Do not expect the actual exam to look like the practice exam. The practice exam is for practice. Okay? Don't be fooled by that. The actual exam may or may not be harder than the practice exam. That is a completely personal and subjective opinion. Okay? Uh, so in terms of the review, uh, here is something that I wanted to throw out to you. I can have the review tomorrow evening uh, over Zoom from 4 p.m. 4.15 to around 5.30. I have to cut short at 5.30 uh, due to other engagements. Or the lecture on Wednesday can be made into a review. So those are the choices. Obviously, I would not want to have the review during a lecture because that wastes time in terms of the material that I can cover. But if you are overwhelmingly, at least the folks who are here, uh, if you are overwhelming, overwhelmingly in favor of having the review during the lecture, how many of you are interested in that? Looks like an even split, pretty much. Okay, so I'll, I'll think about it depending on uh, availability of classrooms or uh, facilities and see if I can maybe have the review on Wednesday or maybe it'll be on Tuesday. Okay, so at this point in time, uh, I'm still leaning towards a Tuesday review, uh, which will be held via Carmen Zoom, uh, most probably. 
If not, it will be in person and it will be recorded like what, what we do typically for lectures. Otherwise, it will be on Wednesday uh, during class time. Okay. And I'll let you know by today evening as to what the choice will be. Okay? Either way, we'll have a review. Uh, during the review, I'll solve a problem on fins. I'll uh, very briefly mention some ideas on radiation. We've been talking a lot about radiation for the past uh, uh, 12 lectures or so, so that is a little more fresh in your memory. This is, unfortunately, typically the material that gets taught after the first midterm and people zone off before you start catching up on radiation. So this is going to be trickier. Okay? Okay. So we are not going to go into the last bit of radiative heat transfer. This is radiation exchange between surfaces. And this is where we start drawing something called as radiative resistance networks. So radiation exchange. between surfaces I'm very briefly going to talk about the idea of radiosity which we have mentioned in the past but I want to refresh your memory J okay this represents the net radiation flux leaving the surface. This is once again a flux or sometimes called as a power in radiation heat transfer. And so J is given as the net radiant flux leaving the surface, which means that you're going to include the emissive flux that leaves the surface, plus whatever is the portion of the radiation that is reflected by the surface. Okay, so this is going to be plus rho times g, where rho is the reflectivity of the surface. have not worked in terms of rho because of the following reason, okay? So this is first of all emissive flux. And this is the flux reflected from the radiation on the surface. And why we talk about, uh, why we don't spend too much time on reflectivity is for the following reason, because of the fact that our surfaces are opaque. If I look at the total irradiation G, this is G absorbed plus G reflected plus G transmitted, but for an opaque surface there is nothing that is transmitted through the volume, so G transmitted is typically zero. This is what we assume in our problems. G absorbed is alpha times G, G reflected is rho times G. So from here, G is alpha times G, rho times G, the fraction of the radiation that is absorbed is alpha times G, fraction of the radiation that is reflected is rho times G, and it is quite obvious to see that alpha plus rho is equal to 1. And which is why in our problems and in the lectures that we've done so far, we do not talk much about reflectivity because if you know absorptivity, you know reflectivity. Okay? So this is old stuff, nothing new. But radiosity is that particular term. And using that definition, here is what I can say. So J, first of all, is E plus rho G. So this is E plus 1 minus alpha g. So this is one equation that we can make use of later on in this class, in this lecture. If I look at the net radiative flux, this is the total flux that is emitted minus whatever is absorbed that will increase the thermal energy due to the irradiation. 
But if I write alpha as 1 minus rho, and then if I combine E and then rho times G, I get the following. So this is now E plus rho times G minus G because I have a negative sign. I run multiply through by G is G minus G times rho, but it's a negative sign. And so I immediately recognize that E plus rho G is the radiosity J. And so we have is J minus G. All right, so this is uh, stuff from before. Similar to how we define the emissive flux using the intensity of the radiant energy that is emitted, we can define radiosity that way. So look at this from before. Emissive flux is just triple integral, we've seen. 0 to infinity, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi by 2. Lambda comma e, lambda theta phi, sine theta, cos theta, d theta, d phi, d lambda. In this integral that we have seen multiple times, this is the intensity of the emitted radiation. This is the spectral directional intensity. Okay, so one should also make a note of that. Spectral directional intensity of the emitted radiation. So that's why you have the subscript little e. I can write the radiosity j using exactly a formula similar to this. Except that instead of talking about the emitted radiation, I can talk about the net intensity leaving the surface. Watch this. Carbon copy, 0 to infinity, 0 to 2 pi, 0 to pi by 2, exactly the same as before. Sine theta cos theta, d theta, d phi, Z lambda. That's also the same as before. We looked at this formula there. We've done that for radiosity. Uh, we've done it for the radiation as well. Now instead of writing I lambda comma E, this is I lambda comma E plus R, where E plus R ref represents the intensity of the radiation that is emitted plus reflected. Okay. This is the spectral directional intensity of a radiation. Instead of saying emitted plus reflected, it is leaving the surface. It is the radiation that is leaving the surface, which is emitted plus reflected. Okay. Leaving is emitted plus reflected. Does this make sense to everybody? The same exact formula, but the intensity is different. And of course, the big thing in radiation heat transfer is, you know, we don't know this intensity, so to define that intensity, we define all these absorptivities, emissivity, and so on which are experimentally obtained. Then by combining it as an ideal body, the Robes Planck's distribution, one can write this intensity, which is what we've been doing all this while. Okay? One last thing before moving on is look at this. If the surface is diffuse, then we can say that this i of lambda comma e plus r is independent of theta and phi. If 
function of wavelength only. And so I can remove it out of the integrals containing sin theta and cosine theta so that j is now 0 to infinity i of lambda p e plus r d lambda then integral sin theta cos theta d theta d phi. This holds true for a diffuse surface and you see in Kirchhoff's law that for a diffuse surface the spectral emissivity and absorptivity are the same. Okay, we will not go there yet. That integral sine theta cosine theta d theta d phi is equal to pi steradians. And so this is going to be now called as a total intensity i e plus r. Leaving surface and this integral sin theta cos theta d theta d phi is pi steradians so j is i e plus r times pi for a diffusion. You can do this on a special basis. You get J lambda, like we defined E lambda. Overkill, we'll not go there. Okay, so with this as the backdrop, I'm going to look at radiation exchange between two surfaces. Okay. I'm once again going to go back to the fundamentals of what we looked at when we began radiation. This might bring back some memories. Okay, so consider a small surface. This is area DA1. Let's say that the unit normal for this is in the vertical direction. N1 hat is the unit normal for this particular area. When we think of radiative heat transfer, we think of it as a surface phenomenon. So I think of a large hemisphere that is placed on top of this little DA1 and radiant energy is streaming through all of those places. So this is typically your hemisphere. Now, if I position another area, DA2, such that the line of sight from DA1 to DA2 is aligned with the unit normal of DA2. This is typically what we have done in the past. N2 hat is a unit normal for DA2. The line of sight from DA1 to DA2 is aligned in the direction of the unit normal. Define this angle as the angle theta1. Okay, this is the angle made by the line of sight with the vertical direction, which is unit normal for area DA1. Now, I want to define DQ12. This is the rate of radiant energy. So this is in watts. Okay, the rate of radiant energy. Leaving surface 1, this is surface 1, this is surface 2, as intercepted by surface 2. Per wavelength basis and for a particular direction. For a particular wavelength and direction. Okay. 
So this is the rate of radiant energy. This is in watts. Leaving surface 1 as intercepted by surface 2. If I have a different surface, dA3 sitting here, then I'm going to have a different term, dQ13. Because that is the rate of radiant energy leaving 1 as intercepted by surface 3. OK? We can define this as the following. Once again, using ideas from our introductory aspects of radiative heat transfer, this is given as the following. I lambda E plus R 1 multiplied by the fraction of the area that an observer on dA2 is seeing. So this is dA1 times cosine theta. theta 1, multiplied by the solid angle subtended by an observer who is sitting at 1 and looking at 2, so d omega 1, 2, multiplied by the wavelength, where i lambda comma e plus r comma 1 is the intensity of the radiation leaving surface 1. Previously, we were operating only by looking at I lambda comma E. We did not have this extra E plus R term, but the expressions remain the same. You would have used this in your previous homework as well. Now, D omega 1, 2 by definition. If I have the situation where the unit normal to A2 is along the line of sight, OK, so this is going to be D A2 by or 1, 2 square, where distance R12 is the distance from A1 to A2, DA1 to DA2. Okay, so this is the situation when line of sight from 1 to 2 is coincident with N2. This is the definition of a solid angle. I hope this brings back some memories. Okay, we've seen expressions of this sort at the beginning of radiative heat transfer. But this is not a general expression because the area dA2 is aligned such that its line of sight is along the normal. So here is a little more general stuff. Instead of dA2 sitting there, how about I take dA2 and I set it up here? such that its unit normal is not aligned with the line of sight. So if this is now dA2, or if I call this as dA2 prime, okay, and if I call this angle here, this is now N2 prime, and now this angle here, if I just extend that, this is theta 2. Okay, and if you want, I can redraw that really quickly here. This is dA2 prime. And two hat. And one hat. Theta one. Theta two. This is dA1. Now, if I have a situation of this kind, the definition of the solid angle has to change because I have to look at the projection of dA2 prime on the hemisphere. Okay, so I will drop a perpendicular. That's there. And so this guy is dA2 prime times cosine theta 2. I'm going to leave the details to you because you've done this in your homework where you have had areas at different angles. Okay, so a more general expression for d omega d omega 1, 2 is dA2 
cosine theta 2 by r12 square. This is for an area dA2 whose unit normal is not along the line of sight. And so I'm going to rewrite that expression for dq12, and you'll see that we're going to slowly work our way into defining something more general. And so more generally, dq12 is all of that stuff, instead of d omega 1, 2, I'm going to substitute dA2 cosine theta 2. So this is I lambda e plus r1 lambda theta phi, then cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, r1, 2 square, dA1, dA2, d What is this quantity? This is the radiant rate of energy leaving surface 1 intercepted by surface 2. And this is in watts. And this is for a fractional area. And this is for a particular wavelength. What if I have a large area now? All I have to do is perform this integration over the large area A1 because it is subtended by another area A2 which could also be equally large. I have to integrate it over A2. Because this is done on a per wavelength basis, I have to integrate over all the wavelengths. And so I get for general areas A1 and A2, exchanging radiant energy between them, let me assume. Okay, big assumption, but it is for many problems, this is not a bad idea. Let me assume that both the areas are diffuse. Assume uh, diffuse. Then I can write the following. Instead of saying dq12, because it's a fraction, because I'm looking at fractional area dA1. Now I'm going to say q12. This is over the integral of all of the area a1 and a2. So q12 is integral 0 to infinity. I lambda e plus r1 d lambda. Because I'm saying that it is diffuse, I don't need to integrate the intensity over all the areas because it's independent of the direction. This is a surface integral a1, surface integral a2, theta1 theta 2, r1, 2 square, dA1, dA2. Likewise, q21, it's the same carbon copy, is 0 to infinity, lambda e plus r. Now you see I'm looking at the radiant energy leaving 2 and reaching 1. So I'm going to look at the intensity of the radiant energy leaving surface 2. So this has to be comma 2 d lambda. And the other integral is going to be the same. Because I would have dA2 cosine theta 2 first. And then when I define the solid angle, it's going to be dA1 cosine theta 1. So this will remain the same. And I'm going to make use of the fact that because things are diffuse, this first integral here look at that. You had it somewhere, or uh, probably with your permission, I'm just going to slide this just a fraction. For a 
a diffuse surface. I have the following. A little more. This integral is nothing but the radiosity of that surface divided by pi. And I'm just going to do the substitution. Okay, so pulling it up. This is just j1 by pi, likewise. This is j2 by pi. Once again, this is for a diffuse surface. That's a strong approximation that we're using. But it's reasonable for a majority of engineering problems. And so I have the following. Look at this. Q12 is J1 divided by pi. Take the pi, put it in an integral. Nothing changes. Your life remains the same. Q21, likewise its counterpart. Is J2 integral a1 integral a2 cosine theta 1 theta 2 1 2 square da1 da2 a lot of writing but this is whittling down to something really nice okay now we are going to define the fundamental fraction for real surface radiation. We're going to define a fraction Fij. Which is the fraction of the radiant energy leaving surface I as intercepted by surface J. Fraction of radiant energy leaving surface I as intercepted by J. So I and J are surfaces, meaning I could be 1, J could be 2, or I could be 2, J could be 1. If you have a million surfaces, I could be a million things, J could be a million things. Typically, we will not have more than three surfaces in our problems. So good news. And this fraction can be defined as the following. Fij is equal to Qij I'm sorry, the opposite of that. It is going to be the fraction, right? So this is going to be whatever is the amount of radiation that is leaving surface I as intercepted by surface J, QIJ, divided by AI, JI. So this is the radiant energy leaving. I as intercepted by J divided by what is AI JI is the total radiant energy leaving the surface I. You see that, right? J, J is the radiosity. Radiosity means everything that leaves. Radiosity is in watts per meter square. So if I want radiant rate, it's watts per meter square multiplied by the area. So AI JI is nothing but the total radiant energy rate that is leaving the surface. And if I say I and J are 1 and 2, F12 is Q12 by a1, J1, F21 is Q21 by A2, J2, notice this, 
the first subscript always tells you this is the area that I'm interested in where radiant energy is leaving. The second subscript tells me this is the area that is receiving all of this bad news. I have Q12, I have Q21. It is a matter of substitution. If I do the substitution, here is what I end up getting. So I'm going to substitute in here. So that I have F12. Notice it is DQ1 by A1, J1, but I have a J1 in the numerator for DQ1. So the J1 cancels off. This is just 1 by A1, integral A1, integral A2, cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, or 1, 2 square, dA1, dA2. If I write F21, 1 by A2, and same integral with the pi. DA1, DA2. Once again, what is F12 is the fraction, F, F meaning fraction always for us, we had this for an ideal body as well. This is the fraction of the radiant energy in watts leaving surface 1 as intercepted by surface 2. It need not be the same as the fraction of radiant energy leaving surface 2 as intercepted by surface 1. Because surface 1 could be small, surface 2 could be huge, their fractions need not be the same. But what is true is the following. I take this guy and bring it there. I take this guy and bring it there. They end up being the same. Because the integral is the same. And so I have one piece of good news, the first one. It's called the reciprocity rule. F12 A1 is equal to F21 A2. Which you can easily see by cross multiplying and cancelling things out. Or in general, I can write that F I J A I is equal to F J I A J because I and J could be anything. So in general, this is the reciprocity rule. F i j a i is equal to F j i a j. And for a given cross section of the area, one can calculate this F12 and F21. Your book has a set of tables. If you're interested, you can look at those tables. I'll post them in my notes as well but we are not going to be calculating any of these things. In our problems, we will do something much more elegant. Okay? So we are going to go to the second thing now. This rule is good, but we want the other one, which is called the summation principle, and here is the idea. Let's say I have three surfaces. Surface 1, surface 2, surface 3. This is Area A1 for surface 1, area A2 for surface 2, area A3 for surface 3. These are all the areas. All of them are sending radiant energy to each other. First thing to notice is that if your surface is convex or if it is just a flat line of this nature, if there is radiant energy leaving one of the surfaces, that same surface cannot feel that radiant energy leaving it. Once again, if I have radiant energy leaving surface A3, the surface 3 cannot feel that energy falling on itself. Which means that F33 is 0. 
the fraction of the radiant energy leaving surface 3 as intercepted by surface 3 is 0 in the situations that we are going to consider. Or Fii is equal to 0. So F11 is 0, F22 is 0, F33 is 0. So that's one. But this is an assumption. Uh, it depends on what type of surfaces you have. We have large concave surfaces. They can see a lot of radiations on themselves. And so we are going to now say the following. Look at surface one. Okay, so consider surface one. What's A1, J1? It is the net radiant energy leaving surface. <coughs> because surface 1 is not receiving any of the energy that leaves it, but it is being generous and giving it all the way to surfaces 2 and surface 3, the net radiant energy that is leaving surface 1 is equal to the net radiant energy intercepted by 2 plus that intercepted by 3 as originating from surface 1. So this is now going to be equal to Q12, Q13. This is the radiant energy leaving 1. as intercepted by 2 and 3 respectively and this is just conservation of energy, I am not doing any fancy stuff. But what do you know? This is very conveniently positioned here. Q i j is f i j times a i j i. Substitute a one j one is now Q one two i is one j is two so that's f one two. A1, J1, AI, JI. What is Q13? I is 1, J is 3. So this is going to be F13, A1, J1. I can also say without any loss of generality, this is F11 times A1 times J1 because F11, that good fellow is 0. I see A1, J1 everywhere, so I'm just going to do what you're all going to do, cancel it off on all sides. And what do you know? F11 plus F12 plus M13 is equal to 1. This is called the summation principle. Or summation, what's this? J is equal to 1 to n, Fij is equal to 1. So, two things that are going to help us in solving problems is the reciprocity rule and the summation principle. And here is a very nice thing it is called as the no one, no all rule. And here is how it works. Now, as I said, uh, well, I typically lie. We will look at four surface enclosures as well, but let us consider three surface enclosures. Okay, so I'm going to consider the three surface enclosures that I've drawn here. Just four kicks, okay? A1, A2, A3. I'm just going to draw it out here. Surface one. Surface 2, 
surface 3, all of them are exchanging radiant energy with each other. Here are the things that are true. F11, F12, F13 is 1. By the same token, I can say F21, F22, F23 is 1. Nothing changes that. I can change the index of summation to i is equal to 3. So F31, 3, 2, 3, 3 is equal to 1. This is always true for a 3 surface enclosure because we just proved it. F11 is 0, 2, 2 is 0, 3, 3 is 0. So if I have a 3 surface enclosure, the idea is I have to calculate 6 of these creatures which is a huge headache, but here is the saving news. Let us say that I know one of them, okay? So say, and in the next lecture we will solve a problem using some of my examples for geometric shapes and so on, just to see how these are calculated, just to show you how painful they are. Let us say that I know F12. If I know F12, then I know F13 is 1 minus F12. So now I know F13. If I know F12 and I know the geometric information, then I also know that F. 1 times A2 is F12 times A1, the reciprocity rule, so that I can calculate F21. Remember, I just know only one of them, F12. Using one, I calculated two more. But if I know F21, what do you know? I know F23. <laughs> If I know F13, I know F31, because I can use the reciprocity for that. If I know F23, I know F32, because I can use reciprocity for that too. So if I know one of these suckers, I know all of them. And it is enough 